Saat farkından merhabalar. Her hafta farklı ülkelerden konuklarla bölgesel ve küresel gelişmelere dair farklı perspektiflere yer vermeye çalışıyoruz. Ee, geçtiğimiz haftalarda olduğu gibi bu haftada yine e, Rusya'nın Ukrayna işgalini ve bunun e, uluslararası sisteme e, özellikle güvenlik alanındaki e, yansımalarını konuşmaya devam edeceğiz. E, Rusya, Sovyetler tarihi ve Kafkasya üzerine çalışmalarıyla tanınan önemli bir akademisyen e, bugün konuğum. E, şu anda New York Üniversitesi Abu Dhabi kampüsünde görev yapıyor. E, tarihçi, sosyolog, Profesör Doktor Georgi Derlugyan bizlerle. Hem Rusya'nın ne yapmaya çalıştığını konuşacağız kendisiyle, nihai hedefini konuşacağız. Hem de Rus işgalinin soğuk savaş sonrası oluşan güvenlik yapılanmasının bundan sonra nasıl değişeceğini, nasıl şekillen, şekilleneceğini konuşacağız. Welcome Professor, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate your time. Good evening. Uh, well, Professor, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and Moscow widens its uh, attacks on uh, different Ukrainian cities. Uh, Some blame Russia, some uh, NATO or the West. Uh, we hear a lot of uh, geopolitical reasoning. Uh, is there something beyond uh, geopolitics? Uh, what are the reasons and motivations uh, for this war? You know, like in so many wars, the motivation is mostly internal. It is internal to one's politics and internal to people's heads. This is what they imagine. Uh, things become strategical when we start thinking about them as strategic. So in, in geopolitics, it is quite true, you know, that in the 1990s, Western alliance began expanding, but not to include uh, the two real important countries in the rest of Europe. Uh, that is Russia and Turkey. You know, so there are two countries which were excluded. That became apparent after 2000. You know, that they're not going to get an invitation. You know, that Turkey has been a member of NATO alliance by invitation since early on, simply because uh, the NATO needed uh, an ally in the south of the Soviet Union, but not in the European Union. With Russia, it was very much the same. However, Russia was a very difficult place to invest in the 1990s. Do you realize it was chaotic and violent? And for this, this reason, it was not uh, the West chose, you know, the e easiest uh, way of dealing with Russia, trying to ignore it mostly. So this is what led to the accumulation of problems. But this is what emboldened Mr. Putin to the extent that he came to believe that The West is actually blind. And watching the American debacle in um, the Middle East, you know, the failure of invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, and also the domestic political problems in many Western countries, you know, when uh, populist, so called populist forces are making significant inroads into mainstream politics, when the mainstream politicians seemed in trouble, these all convinced some people in Moscow that they have an upper ground morally and psychologically. And that was a miscalculation. So this is what happens in this war. You know, so it was to demonstrate that fighting spirit in Russia is much stronger than in the West, that Russia is a different civilization. And as a different civilization, it deserves to be treated with special respect. We are going to have human rights, but they are going to be our human rights. This is going to be our sovereign democracy, not the way you prescribe this to us. And when it came to a very simple confrontation, simple in terms of conventional warfare, it's guns against guns, missiles against missiles, and also the economy against economy. This is where is a big trap. It's not a mistake. It's a blunder. It's a very difficult mistake you know, for Russia. They uh, got into fighting because essentially of one man, because the whole polity now depends on one man. Mm -hmm. Since the death of Stalin, there had never been such a concentration of power in the hands of a single decision maker. And that decision maker apparently got carried away by his own reading of history and mm -hmm. philosophy. It is remarkable that 
Mr. Putin and writing articles about history recently and publishing them. You know, this is very rarely seen among acting presidents. And yet, there it is. Yes, I was going to just uh, come to that, uh, Professor Darlugian. Uh, to what extent, uh, I wonder, uh, is Putin's personality and his view of history a factor here? Uh, do you agree with those analyses uh, suggesting that uh, Putin is trying to rewrite history and huge. revive the Russian Empire? Uh, not empire as such, but power. Let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. Because Putin is definitely not uh, a Russian communist. Let's put it this way. So the previous iteration of empire was communist Soviet Union. Before that, it was the empire of the Tsars. I don't think this is very uh, possible. Very, since, uh, let me use the example of Turkey, you know, because these two countries are actually very similar in their trajectories. They both emerge in the 16th century. So what was, you know, Mehmet Fatih Sultan, you know, or, uh, or what was uh, Selim Yavuz Sultan? You know, for Russia, it was Ivan the Terrible. So at that time, both emerged as significant regional gunpowder empires in their realm. Then both of them tried to modernize Russia under Peter the Great, Tanzimat, you know, for the Turkish Empire. Both of them, both Ottomans and Russians, got into the war in World War I, which was a disaster for both of them. Both of them emerged defeated, but with a new, strong, charismatic leader, a nationalist and military leader in Turkish case, Atatürk, the future Atatürk, and the communist leader uh, in the Soviet case, Lenin, who was very soon succeeded by Stalin. So both of them became superpowers, but at the threshold of Europe. And the problem for both of them was the question, what is going to, be, to happen next? So what is this model you know, of uh, nationalist development as in Turkey or communist development as uh, in Russia? I don't think that there is no evidence you know, that Mr. Putin is at all thinking like a communist, hmm. but he's thinking in terms of great power politics. So he thinks, you know, that Russia deserves, you know, to be uh, a serious power as it has been in, in the last 500 years. However, his thinking is not economical. You know, his thinking is primarily military and let's say public relations. You know, let's uh, remember, you know, that he is not a regular military officer. He is an intelligence officer. You know, so much of what he does is more of a covert operation with big components of uh, propaganda, with decoys, with uh, false moves. So now it's actually for the first time, you know, that he's engaged in a real military operation. He decided to do this for some reason, which we are not going. We are not going to learn ever. You know, he's not never going to tell us, you know, what was going on on his mind. Right. But definitely, at the same time, we can. He set out everything. He told the whole world, you know, because he had been speaking and speaking about it, you know, that he wants Russia to be a serious power in uh, its part of the world. It will be a new kind of Russian empire. But today I doubt that it will succeed. Uh, why do you think so, Professor? Why do you think uh, he's not going to succeed? For the same reasons as before, uh, first of all, uh, it's the economic reason, because every time somebody speaks about a big pr prosperity zone, uh, we are going to influence, uh, well, our countries, uh, Turkey and Russia, once again, you know, they very much like to think of themselves as big brother, and there are lesser brothers, you know, there are brothers, they're brothers, we like them very much, you know, like Ukraine, like Kazakhstan, you know, but uh, of course, you know, it's obvious who is the elder brother. However, if you are becoming a leader regionally in anything, it comes with a cost. And I don't think, you know, that the people who, uh, who discuss geopolitics in these terms, in terms of national pride, in terms of history, in terms of philosophy, these are the people who also think in terms of macroeconomic performance, in terms of technology transfers, export markets, import flows, so it is actually quite amazing, you know, uh, how little analysis 
and preparation went into the possible sanctions. It's going to be war, but war by different means, where uh, countries of the caliber, economic caliber of Russia and Turkey, have, stand no chance. Even China, you know, so what we see now uh, is probably a demonstration of Western capacity, not just to Russia, but to many other countries. You know, look what we can do. You know, we can turn off your energy flows. We can turn off your financial flows, you know, so still control not only the best uh, universities, but the currency, which everybody in the world, you know, so this is a demonstration for many others and uh, why America is so interested in it, because uh, the previous administrations, George W. Bush was stupid enough to invade Iraq and Afghanistan. They made their own mistake. It was a big mistake mistake and it ended in a disaster and many people mistook this for the end of american hegemonic position in the world so, and also european union position you know that many people thought that germany would never be a military power or again because of the very bad memories of 20th century germany but we see an incredible reversal of fortunes now it we are just in the early days it's early to predict you know, what is going to happen, but it looks like the European Union is also being consolidated, acquiring a new political and military profile. This is probably a new European Union. For a long time, we've been speaking about problems in the European Union, and now it looks like they are trying to solve those problems, having a very convenient, very identifiable, dislikable, enemy. So there is nothing better to unite a nation or several nations than to have a common enemy. This is what we are watching now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Professor, of course, this recent crisis is part of a series of uh, crises between Russia and the West over the past uh, 30 years, more than 30 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And, but now, as you also touched upon, uh, Western sanctions, I think, will uh, isolate Russia from uh, Europe perhaps even more fully than uh, in the Cold War. So what do you expect, uh, what shall we expect uh, for the future relations between Russia and the West uh, from now on? More Western isolation, uh, more Russian aggression ahead? Aggression, uh, it's a very good question, you know, so what can they do? You know, so uh, Mr. Putin and many people around him must be now fighting for their life, literally. You know, because what could be awaiting them, let's face it, something like the tribunal in The Hague, what happened to Yugoslavia or to Serbia. So this, the stakes are very harsh, you know, so they must stay in power. There is no way they can quit power. But at the same time, you know, so how are they going to extricate themselves from Ukraine, which is becoming a very big Chechnya. So what is happening there and what is on the mind of all Russian officers, for sure, that this is becoming very much like the Chechen resistance. And ironically, of course, there are some Chechen fighters and Cherkassian, Cherkass fighters on the Russian side, which is not going to, to help very much. You know, so now storming big cities like Kiev or Kharkov is going to look very much like the Battle of Grozny in 1995. It's going to be awful. So what could be the next escala escalation? Uh, Russia or Putin, we should be specific about it, Mr. Putin threatened to use nuclear weapons. Yeah. He has atomic weapons, you know, but can he use them? You know, it's not so easy, not only just psychologically, it's organizationally very difficult because there is a whole succession since the Cold War of commanders and uh, how do I say precautions, you know, that it doesn't happen by mistake, because there were precedents, you know, when nuclear weapons could be unleashed almost by mistake. But this is not uh, like in the films when there is just one single red button. You press the button and the rockets will fly. Uh, so the people, you know, who will be listening now to Putin must have thoughts, you know, that first, first of all, you know, what if they fulfill these kind of orders, they're dead. They're very likely dead. And if they survive, next they're going to International War Crimes Tribunal. 
most, most likely. You know, so I don't see much prospect of even a settlement. You know, so all this talk about negotiations, you know, that it will end in some kind of stalemate. All this looks very improbable because Russia, first of all, is not a, as big as the Soviet Union and nowhere as rich. The Soviet Union was one, one third American GDP. Russia is only one fifteenth of American GDP. The Soviet Union tried with great difficulty to produce almost everything that they needed. For instance, domestic airplanes, passenger airplanes. Russia is now Airbus and Boeing. You know, once the spare parts for those airplanes run out, and the specialists are telling us that they will run out in a month, too, what happens to domestic flights? Already, so I don't think you know that Russia can exist like Albania in the 1960s. Remember, there was Enver Hoxha, that regime surrounded on all sides, Albanian communist regime, which was sustained by China. So this is a possibility, of course, you know, a militaristic and very nationalist regime, which is protected by Chinese, you know, because they need it as ally mm -hmm. and because they need its resources. But basically, what we see is. Uh, American and West European, primarily German and French, reversal fortunes. And this could be very dangerous, especially for our part of the world, for the for Syria. Mm -hmm. Did you think you know what might happen in Syria? Yes, that's also very or what important. might happen in Karabakh. Yeah. You know, so the, between Azerbaijan and, and Armenia, only Russian troops are standing now. Mm -hmm. So will this be another war? And what would be the reaction of of Germany to such an eventuality. So we have to uh, after tomorrow, two weeks from tomorrow, a month and a year. Yeah, uh, Professor, I was going to uh, ask you also the implications and consequences of Russia's invasion, of course. Uh, what do you think, what, I mean, what are the possible implications and consequences of this invasion uh, for the Caucasus uh, specifically and other post-Soviet republics? We shall see, uh, everything depends now on how European Union would be able to hold their line, their sanctions, which are painful to themselves. So this is a war, and if nothing is done you know, for uh, wartime financing, there is, uh, and for uh, wartime mobilization, let me remind you, you know, just uh, United States during the Second World War had a rationing system, and they managed to keep inflation as low as just 5%. Thanks to whom? John Kenneth Galbraith, you know, who was running, you know, this, this operation from Washington. You know, so read more attentively, you know, so we, these, these are the nearest lessons, you know, almost forgotten now because it was two generations ago. So the question is not so much about Russia and the former republics. The question is about energy supplies to Germany and Italy uh, over the summer and especially in the coming winter, winter of 2023. Hmm. So this is why I would recommend, you know, watch the uh, pipeline from the Eastern Mediterranean. That gas, you know, that uh, Turkey scored an important diplomatic success in January when America withdrew from this pipeline. So let's watch, you know, what is going to happen to this pipeline now. Let's watch what happens to coal in Europe. You know, will they switch back to coal generated electricity and in France to nuclear power? Will it be possible politically and what kind of uh, politics would be necessary for them you know, to go to into such sacrifices? And then if Europe sacrifices enough and they feel it, you know, that they have done something important and they win that war, the rest, I am afraid, you know, it's not, we're speaking not only about the former Soviet republics, we're speaking about Libya and Syria, there will be, and Iraq probably, you know, there will be a reconfiguration, if not of the entire world system, then at least of the European neighborhood. So the... Nobody in Europe wants to see repetition of events like in Kazakhstan earlier this year. Remember Kazakhstan, Almaty? Mm -hmm. It was just two months ago. Yeah. It was like a century ago. You know, but this is what is threatening. You know, there are very fragile regimes in Central Asia. And in the Caucasus, you know, most fragile is actually not Georgia or Armenia. It's Azerbaijan because it's too similar to the regimes of 
Central Asia. This is what is on the minds of American and European planners now, and this is what they will have to do. So all these conflicts, which, were, uh, which Putin was trying to use, Transnistria in Moldova, the Crimea, Abkhazia, Ossetia, Karabakh, they will be solved. They will be solved in one package. There will be probably one solution found for all of them. And that solution will have to apply to Kosovo as well, because there are other unfinished items of business, and we should be watching again you know, what is happening a year or two from now, what is possible to happen. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, Professor, also, I also want to ask you one more question on Ukraine, uh, from Ukrainian perspective. Uh, are you surprised that uh, Ukrainians have shown an astonishing level of patriotism and resistance in the face of a very aggressive Russian invasion? Um, where do you see the sources of this Ukrainian patriotism? Uh, because I think we have not seen that uh, level of patriotism when Russia annexed Crimea. Uh, what is different now? Oh, no, no. This is uh, absolutely predictable. You know, that this happens uh, in almost, first of all, in all revolutions. Mm -hmm. Because in the Crimea, you actually saw this resistance. Had it not been, you know, for the Ukrainian resistance, uh, there would be Russian forces not only in Lugansk, but also in Kharkiv and in Odessa. You know, so it's very important to notice what did not happen. You know, had it not been for the Ukrainian resistance and, of course, Western support for this resistance, in, in 2014, already seven, eight years ago, there would be much bigger Russian advances in Ukraine. There would be no Ukraine. So Ukraine had time to prepare psychologically and materially, but primarily psychologically. Nation, you know, but nations are created exactly by these kind of terrible events. Like, again, for you to understand this, you know, Turkish nation was created in 1923. And you understand how that happened. Armenian nation was created in, uh, after genocide after, in the 1920s in, in immigration. Uh, French nation was created under Napoleon Bonaparte. So these are the moments, you know, this kind of wars or national trauma is what creates the nations, what happens next. You know? So I am not at all surprised uh, this is very much like Chechnya, again, you know, this is like Chechen resistance. And it has very different prospects, uh, unlike Chechnya, simply because it's much bigger and it has open border with the West and it has uh, a lot of willingness from the West at least to supply a guerrilla war in uh, Ukraine. So militarily, the situation is hopeless. Russia has already lost. And you saw it, you know, that Mr. Putin today authorized uh, bringing Middle Eastern volunteers. He calls them, you know, Syrian volunteers or whoever. Uh, this is a sign of desperation. You know, why do you need, you know, this kind of uh, military force, you know, if you are winning a war? These are very bad signs. And this is why I, th I don't think that uh, this crisis is going to be very fast. Uh, uh, this, this crisis is going to be very fast unfolding, you know, so I don't think it's going to be many years. Some people think it will be like siege warfare. No, it's very unlikely. So the question is what happens to Mr. Putin? And then the question is, you know, who will handle Russia and the disintegration, you know, because Russia will be in a state of disintegration after him. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, well, thank you very much, Professor. Really uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye, Professor. Nice seeing you. Evet, e, saat farkında bu hafta da e, Rusya'nın Ukrayna işgalini ve bunun e, etkilerini uluslararası sisteme, düzene, e, bundan sonrası için e, ne gibi etkileri olacağını konuştuk. E, Profesör Doktor e, Georgi Derlugan ile New York Üniversitesi Abu Dhabi kampüsünden tarihçi, sosyolog. E, önümüzdeki hafta yine farklı bir konuyla, farklı bir konukla görüşmek dileğiyle. Hoşçakalın.